Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandy Gadia, and I am the Outreach Coordinator in the Office of Sustainability. Um, I manage our communications and outreach programs, and I'm here with Mackenzie, who is our Green Office intern this year, as well as a graduate student. Um, do you want to introduce yourself briefly, Mackenzie? Yeah, hi. My name is Mackenzie Guthrie. I am a, an English MA graduate student. Uh, within the English department. I'm also a graduate assistant at the Writing Center. And like Dunby mentioned, I am the Green Office intern for this year. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we both work within the Office of Sustainability, which is located within the Division of Administration and within the Department of Environmental Safety, Sustainability and Risk. And the Green Office program was actually created several years ago um, by the Office of Sustainability to make it easy and accessible and provide more guidelines for staff across campus to implement sustainable practices in order to align with university goals and commitments to be more sustainable. Um, we also would love to have each of you introduce yourself um, and share your name and which office you are here representing, if you don't mind. Um, if you're not able to unmute and share your name verbally, you can also, in your office, you can also do so in the chat. Um, so I'll just call on the first person I see on my screen, which is Rebecca Riley. Do you want to get started? Sure. Hi, my name is Rebecca Riley. I'm the program management specialist for the Health Professions Advising Office on campus. Um, and yeah, this is my first official Green Office program training. Excited. Okay, I see Nancy next. Hi there, I am Nancy Alfonsi and I am coordinator for the for Carlo Colello, the vice president of administration. And um, I have done green offices in other places, but I'm very excited to be involved with it here. So hooray, I'm here. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you. Um, Kiara? Hi, my name is Kiara, and I'm the Program Management Specialist for the Business Office at HDQM. And I am the new Green Office representative, and I'm really excited to be here. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Jen? Good morning, I'm Jen Osborne. I'm the Rentals Partnership and Administrative Coordinator at the Clary Smith Performing Arts Center. Um, I was our Green Office rep Pre-pandemic, uh, we've actually combined some offices in our building. So I do have a co-chair, Tyler Clifford, who couldn't make it today, but I will make sure to give him all the highlights. So thank you so much for having us. I think I actually see Tyler. Yay, yeah, you made it. Hi. I made it. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure if I could make it here, but hello everyone. Glad to see you. Uh, my name is Tyler, pronouns are he, him, and I'm an administrator. Uh, along with Jen at the Clary Smith Performing Arts Center. And this is my first Green Office training, so happy to be here. And um, Sarah? Hi, my name's Sarah Mood. I am here for Honors Humanities today. Sorry, I see that you unmuted yourself, but I didn't hear anything. Um, if you're having audio issues, feel free to um, introduce yourself in the chat. Um, and I have a message from T. Kleiner. I'm not sure whose name that is, um, saying that they may not be ready. OK, cool. Um, so I think we'll, oh, sorry, that was my fault. I had. I had my audio off. <laughs> okay, so you can go ahead and get started. So first we wanted to just kind of give an overview of what we're planning to, to do today. Um, this is actually our first time doing green office training virtually, um, but we're gonna try to make it interactive and um, pull in interactive components throughout um, the different sections we'll be covering. Um, so we're just wrapping up introductions now. We're going to give a bit of an overview about why sustainability is important to us and encourage you all to reflect for yourselves 
on why sustainability is important to you and how, it, how we might frame it in a way that could resonate with your colleagues. We'll talk about what UMD is doing institutionally around progress and goals around sustainability. Um, so you can see how what we do as individuals and within our offices fits into the bigger picture of what is the University of Maryland doing about this? And then what are the steps you can take to become a green office? Um, some tips and reminders around sustainability um, as things have changed over the years and we want to make sure everyone's up to speed on opportunities and programs about sustainability. So the first, turn yourself. Okay. So the first thing that we wanted to do to kind of get everyone sort of interacting and thinking about things is do a little bit of breakout room work where we talk about why does sustainability matter to you and why you are here. And then we'll come back here and we can share um, our thoughts together. And we'll talk a little bit about um, this ring of concentric circles that we have. So we can split, we're gonna split y'all into breakout rooms and we're gonna pull up whiteboards and then we can all kind of share what we're thinking. I think probably two. We'll just try. <laughs> so, hi. Well, so we just have a, uh, we're just hoping to get you all thinking a little bit about sustainability and why it's important to you and also partly why you're here. Um, we have, there's a couple different ways to add text to this, including text boxes. So you don't have to try to like draw with squiggles. <laughs> so. So are y'all able to actually access the whiteboard as well? I'm not able to, but I can go first if you want to, if you don't mind being the typer. I can also do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think I, I, I couldn't introduce myself. I was having trouble logging in. Um, I'm, I'm Taylor. I'm in the um, Department of Communication and um, I'm new to this position and the person who was here previously before me had started the certification, but didn't actually finish it. Um, so it's important to our department, um, I think as a part of the larger university to go through this because I think you're, I think sometimes people think, oh, it's too small and like what I do doesn't matter, but as it grows, it, it really does. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So maybe like important to be a part of the bigger picture. Yeah. Well, I figured out how to edit the <laughs> whiteboard. You just go to the view options at the top there and the drop down menu includes annotate. I just drew that little squiggle there. Yay, okay. So y'all potentially can annotate the whiteboard. It's been a while since I've had to use it. Should we? So should yeah. I like type my answers then or should I? Um, I would recommend typing instead of trying to draw with the uh, pen. Uh, but yeah, anyone is welcome to and you can change what color you're working with. Um, so yeah, we're just going to spend a couple of minutes here kind of brainstorming and then come back to the larger group. Um, I'm not a young woman, as most of you can probably see. Um, and I remember back during a time when 
a lot of these initiatives were started. And I'm talking about in the 1960s and 1970s, okay? And all of these great intentions and all of this science and all of this stuff that was going on, all of the things that are happening now were predicted back then. Mm -hmm. And everybody put all these kinds of projects and dreams and hopes onto the table and nobody ever did anything about them, okay? Mm -hmm. So in that period of time, we have made the problem worse and worse and worse to the point where we're, we're, we're not, if we don't do something now and everybody doesn't do something now, it's, it is going to be, in many cases, irrecoverable. And there's, that's a point of sadness for me because I have watched this process for so long with people basically not doing anything. And I see a lot more energy now and I see a lot more dedication to it. But um, that's the thing. We have to not get to that point of ir irrecoverability, um, which is close. It's close. And there are a lot of species that are already gone. And there's a lot of, of uh, ecosystems that are already too damaged. Um, so that's my, that's why it's important. Mm -hmm. So. Heard a little bit. Um, Taylor, you mentioned why you were why you were joining here. What about uh, you, Sarah, Nancy? What are what are some more some more of your reasons specifically for being part of this program? I added that little paragraph about how I feel like when we do things publicly and together, you inspire more people to make changes personally, and then they carry forward things publicly. Like you know, if we want to make large changes. Um, you have to change a, a culture um, where we get a sense of this is work each of us should and could be doing. I'm not seeing where you added your response. Oh, no. Oh, there we go. OK, it might not have loaded until you clicked out of it. Here we go. All right, yeah, that's great. So I am going to. So. Yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out how to make this more interactive in person. So we appreciate uh, you all kind of being our guinea pigs here as we figure out uh, how to move forward at this point. So I am gonna save the whiteboard so we can share later. We're counting down to leaving the breakout rooms. We'll just look at each other till everyone else comes in. <laughs>
So when I have this one, Are, are y'all able to see this whiteboard we have pulled up? Are you able to see it? Alrighty, that's very rude of it. We good? Cool. Alrighty, so we had some good discussion going in our group after some technical issues. Um, uh, if anyone from our group wants to share a little bit about their reasons and some of the things that we wrote down on this whiteboard. I will. I mean, I, I, it's like I shared with my particular group is that I'm a young, not a young woman, and I have been watching the the general society um, huff and puff about this for, for decades. And in the interim period, the, the situation has gotten worse and worse. And instead of words, there have to be actions. And um, we are now, as I put, I put on the whiteboard, that you know we're, we're getting to a point where certain things are unrecoverable and we need to stop that. Um, and um, I think that's the critical point is it has to stop because we have come to an, an unrecoverable era. And we've already lost um, ecosystems, we've lost bios, biosphere uh, activity, um, all of those things, um, you know, they, they won't come back. We just lost the last white rhino, I think, or something like that, there's like two left, you know, those kinds of things. These are these are just too important. And, and if you don't take a, a, a draw a line in the sand and say, we're not going any further, we're not, we're not going to allow this to happen anymore, then it's just gonna be like it has been for the last decades and decades. So there you go. Very true. Thank you for sharing that again with the larger group. So does anyone else from our group want to talk about uh, the, the things they added to the whiteboard? Sure. Um, ours didn't show up, I don't think. But um, our consensus was that it's, like I said earlier, it's just really stressful thinking about what's going on and how little people do their part or even care, because obviously they're going to be dead by the time you know we have 150 degree summers. Um, so it's kind of a selfish, like I don't enjoy feeling anxious every day about what's going on in California or a pipeline or in my building, which doesn't recycle. I'm canceled. Oh my God. Thank you. So I see that Sunvi has what her group talked about pulled up so we can move on to what they were saying. Yeah, we weren't able to figure out the whiteboard, but I used the old-fashioned Google um, Docs. Um, my practices proved futile, <laughs> um, but I, I think Tyler was saying community is a form, sustainability is a form of community care, and kind of the connection that we have as individuals to creating social change and to be um, caring for one another and recognizing our interconnection. I thought was really powerful. Um, it is life or death, <laughs> we will die, people are already dying. Um, there's already like a lot of displacement and refugees and issues stemming from environmental and climate crises. Um, it's stressful to know how terrible the state of the environment is. It um, creates a lot of anxiety and discomfort and a great outlet for that is taking action and collaborating with others who also care and are also there to take action. Um, and as a university, we're kind of uniquely positioned to have an influence over social change in, in our next generation. Um, and working towards healing the planet feels like a higher calling. I thought was also a powerful, powerful message that was shared. But if anyone else wants to chime in, please do. One thing I would add, and I think you, Tom V, brought this up, but the importance of modeling for students, the college students who are sort of the next generation of um, 
leaders, policymakers, and I thought that was also really important too. There we go. So um, the reason that we have these concentric circles and a lot of y'all were saying very, very similar things is the idea that all of these things build on one another. We can't have a healthy economy without a healthy society and we can't have a healthy society without a healthy environment. Um, these things are not separate and we, all, we need to work on all of them together. There we go. So we have a couple of statistics. Um, so we shared some ones that we thought were particularly kind of terrifying, but one in three people lack access to safe drinking water. Um, and so what we're doing sort of on the university side to help combat this water wastage and lack of clean water, um, UMD's Engineers Without Borders program works on clean water projects. Um, on the research side, UMD has a lot of research advantage, advances in water conservation and remediation. And then right here on campus, we have plenty of refillable water bottle filling stations. Um, so that we're not wasting the water, the clean water we do have access to. Um, air pollution. So apparently, so one in five deaths are due to air pollution. That number is actually higher than a few years ago when it was only one in eight deaths, which is already too many. Um, and 91% of people breathe highly polluted air. So uh, from, U from UMD's work, uh, we are committed to carbon neutrality by 2025. Um, the Climate Action Plan actually used to be committed to carbon neutrality until up by 2050. But uh, when President Pines came in, he moved that goal forward because we were already a little bit ahead of where we had hoped to be. Um, and we have cut carbon emissions by 62% since 2005 when we started forming these climate action plans. And on the research side, uh, UMD Research and Innovation has helped lead to clean energy advances and there are many clean buildings on campus. It's campus policy now that any buildings have to be clean buildings that are carbon neutral. Um, and lastly, this was another thing that definitely came up a lot is uh, human activity that has altered the Earth's surface. Um, on the left, we have some, we have a time lapse basically of de deforestation starting in 1620 all the way to 1920. And in 300 years, we've lost so much of our forest and that has resulted in a massive amount of species extinction. Um, the, you know, thousands of years ago, the world was 1% human and 99% wild animals. And now it's 1% wild animals, 67% livestock and 32% human um, by weight. So we have a lot, we, we're, we, are, we, we mentioned massive species extinction and that is very true. Um, and at UMD, there's a Wildlife Society student organization that is helping to promote conservation of wildlife, um, to combat deforestation on our own campus. 23% of campus is covered with tree canopy. Hopefully that will be more. And as there are, there's a lot of habitat loss going on, UMD pollinator gardens and habitats, that's sort of a great combination of facilities as well as faculty. So, Universities, including University of Maryland, are working on innovative new ways to address the challenges that we're facing. It's really nice to be at the University of Maryland because we have so many different areas of effort that are linked to world sustainability. We've installed solar panels on many of our parking garages, developing new ways of handling waste, the modernization of our on-campus power system. 
These are all real tangible activities that have been supported by the administration and demanded by the students. President Darrell Pines has announced an ambitious goal to make the University of Maryland a net carbon neutral campus by 2025 and to transition the entire university vehicle fleet to electric by 2035. All new buildings are currently carbon neutral and integrate green design features such as green roofs and solar panels. Interior spaces incorporate compost bins and motion detector lights. Campus buildings are also living labs for sustainability, where students can design and test new solutions, such as this patent-pending device that prevents unnecessary toilet flushing. My work here with the Maryland Energy Innovation Initiative has really reaffirmed for me the power of innovation, and that's where collaborations really come into play. We have super environmental programs, the public policy department, active players in the Smith School of Business, and then we have our technology department, science and engineering, and all those people exist here at University of Maryland. We're creating innovative natural solutions that protect the environment while serving our campus. Nutrient-rich substrates are now used on area rooftop farms. Sphagnum moss is a part of the pool filtration system in the Epley Recreation Center, reducing reliance on pool chemicals and saving water. And we have a sustainable farm in Upper Marlboro and growing spaces around campus. Some of the produce from these ventures is served in campus dining halls, sold at the campus farmer's market, or donated to community members in need. We try to be a steward of natural resources within our watershed. To that end, water draining across campus is measured and monitored by strategically placed stormwater sensors and controls before flowing into the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Sustainability is part of who we are. That's why there are nearly 50 degree programs that prepare students to work on environmental issues. For faculty and staff, there are numerous programs they can participate in while reducing their environmental footprint. The University of Maryland campus is so beautiful. So as I think about climate and environment and sustainability, I'm just inspired by the beauty of the world around me and highly motivated and always optimistic that we're gonna be able to preserve this beauty and this system for our future generations. All right, wonderful. So the Office of Sustainability um, created this video in partnership with Strategic Communications, um, which is the university department that handles communications for the university. Um, so that's where that video came from. And I think it really summarizes some of our key goals around, you know, integrating the way that we operate as a university in terms of our infrastructure and policies and practices with the innovation that's happening on the academic side, within student advocacy, and within research and innovation. So it's a really exciting place to be positioned to leverage broader changes in our society as a whole, and our political systems and economic systems. Um, the university has something called the Sustainability Council that oversees our progress towards sustainability, and they established the six goals in the previous slide um, that our efforts are organized around. So the, unit, the Office of Sustainability tracks data and metrics on each of these topic areas. And we have a website called the Progress Hub um, where you can explore data visualizations and data dashboards that are actually interactive, as well as articles and stories about the progress that the university is making towards becoming more sustainable in all areas. Mm -hmm. And just in April of this year, 2021, President Pines did accelerate our, our commitment to carbon neutrality and really put out a call to action that everyone in our campus community um, contribute to those goals. So there are things that are happening institutionally and systemically, but each of our individual habits and behaviors also have a cumulative impact on how sustainable we can be. So as we mentioned earlier, since 2005, when we did our initial greenhouse gas inventory of assessing where our emissions come from and how we can reduce them, we have reduced emissions by 62% as of 2020. 
Um, all new buildings have to be built to green design standards and must be carbon neutral. Um, our, and we've committed to our campus fleet of vehicles being fully electric by 2035. And as, as of 2020, all of our purchased energy come from renewable sources. So some of those are some of the bigger strategies that are part of our climate action plan. And you can see here the breakdown of what are the sources of the university's emissions and what are we doing to um, address them. So we do purchase verified carbon offsets to invest in offsite um, sustainability projects that sequester carbon, such as tree plantings, um, to offset air travel and undergraduate commuting, as well as new construction. And there's a lot of efforts being made to make our buildings and our, our energy systems more efficient, use less resources, cre um, create less emissions, and transition towards clean energy and away from fossil fuels. All right, I'll hand it over to Mackenzie. Thank you. So, the part. Oh, should I do the poll then? Is that what you're saying? So, take that back. Before I start talking, there's actually a poll um, that if y'all wouldn't mind taking, we'd really appreciate it briefly. It's only a couple questions, nothing written in or anything. So while you're answering those couple of questions, I'm going to start talking about the Green Office program. This is where we come in and where y'all come in. So the Green Office program is a voluntary self-guided program um, that supports and rewards offices for taking action. Um, and it focuses on personal actions of individuals in the office. It was designed and launched in 2007 by a UMD advisory committee uh, made up of different people across campus that included students and staff and faculty. Um, we provide lots of checklists and tools that can guide you through the different levels of certification, which starts at bronze, goes on to silver, gold, and then platinum. There we go. So we want to just briefly define office um, because there are a lot of offices on campus that are much larger. Um, so it is a self-defined unit. Um, when green offices sign up, they sort of define what their office space is, um, but we consider it to be a work area or unit that shares common areas. Um, that ends up being a lot more helpful than trying to do a big office that is technically an office, but is spread across campus in different workplaces with people that don't interact together as much. Um, and they share purchasing and resources and leadership. We find that somewhere in a range of three to 30 people is helpful, much more than that, and people aren't necessarily interacting as much. Um, if you do have an office that has more people than that, we definitely try, definitely recommend uh, breaking your office up into different groups. If there's sort of a business group and then a social, a um, social media communications outreach group, and then those groups can have their different green reps and they can work together. Um, and these offices include part-time, full-time employees, students, as well as interns trying to get everybody across campus who works in that office involved. So the process to certify as a green office, first you register. Um, we're going to look through the green office website once I move through this and I'll show you where the registration is if anyone is uncertain. You register, you get approval from the leadership in your office. We find that as if there is administrative approval for these things, they're more likely to happen. Um, then you fill out the registration form. There is a pledge that you sign. Um, Studies show that if you sign your name to something and it's visibly posted, you're more likely to follow through with it. Um, there are different checklists depending on which uh, certification level you're looking at, and those different checklists have different activities starting at bronze. And then there is a consultation so we can come in and talk with you, um, see if you're having different challenges, different things that, about your space or your office that you want to talk with us with, whether you're proud or it's something that you are having difficulty with. And then you submit 
a certification form and get certified. And we provide you with a certificate and certification lasts for one year. So from the date that you're certified up to one calendar, calendar year later, that's how long that lasts. And then you would recertify the next year by filling out an audit again and a staff survey. And then, oh, uh -oh it got dark. <laughs> um, so you can aim for the same certification for the next year or for even a higher certification. But if you do go for a higher certification, those actions are cumulative. So we ask that if you are aiming for silver certification, second year that you keep doing those actions you committed to at the bronze level. So we're gonna look at the Green Office website. Um, this is our website, it's a Google site we recently moved. And from here, you, that we have a couple links to why you should join, um, steps to getting certified, and a list of certified offices. So as soon as you register, even at the level of just participating before bronze certification, you are listed on that site. Um, if you go under the certified tab, we have some tips before you begin about gaining office support, gaining approval from the leadership within your office, as well as the audit that you will do as part of the process. That helps you sort of understand where your office is at before you're starting. Um, there is the registration, like I mentioned, and then there are, there are different levels. So for example, if we look at the bronze checklist, these are the activities that we suggest that you do. You, would, you only need to perform 75% uh, of the actions. So for the bronze checklist, that's 23 items. You don't need to do every single thing. So we have these lists. And then if you scroll down, we talk about each one in a little bit more detail. Um, so I'm going to go back to the presentation now. And then there are a lot of benefits of getting certified. Um, it helps lead by example. So if you are, you, you set an example for other offices near you, other people that you work with, you are helping to support UMD's strategic plan and the climate action plan that we've talked a lot about already. Um, the activities are designed for you to work smarter, not harder. This is not intended to be something that is outrageously difficult. It's something that should not be super, super hard, but is very achievable, which makes it all the more reason why you should do it. Um, you help set new cultural norms within your office space. Those people respond best to cultural norms and following what other people are doing. So if you start setting those examples, more people are likely to follow. And even if it doesn't feel like a lot for one person to be recycling their paper, um, that adds up a lot. When there are 50,000 people on campus, you can make a much bigger impact and it helps to conserve resources and cut costs when you're all working together. So this is what the pledge looks like. It, um, when you register and would like a pledge, we send that to you and you can all fill it out. And like I mentioned earlier, research demonstrates that you're more likely to follow through on a commit commitment when you sign your name to it, especially when it's in a public place. So what y'all are here for today as Green Office representatives, you are the ones that receive trainings like this um, and have annual meetups that helps, uh, y'all heard it in the center, awesome. Um, have annual meetups where you can discuss sort of how your office is doing with other green office representatives and start building a network of people that are very excited about doing things like this. You are the leader for your office as you're going through certification and meeting all those steps. And you are the ones that help implement checklists with your colleagues. And we have a green office newsletter that we send out to all of you and you can relay that information to your colleagues. Um, the information in the office newsletter is often themed around a certain topic, food, water, transportation, waste. Um, and you can share the information that you see in those newsletters with your colleagues. Let me pull up the, here's an example of the newsletter. So this is one that we sent out previously um, with a, a challenge on recycling waste, the different checklists that we offer in case you need a reminder. Um, this was when glass moved to no longer being recycled with everything else. We have quizzes and other things to get you engaged, videos, information. That's the kind of thing that we offer in our newsletter that you would then communicate to the rest of your office. So we have four levels of certification. Bronze certification is meant to be something that you can do quickly. Not a lot of changes, doesn't cost anything. There is silver certification, which is still pretty simple and involves minimal cost. 
Gold is where it starts to be more of an investment to be involved. Um, that is where you start to really, really dedicate to making changes. And then platinum is a little bit different from the rest because there's no checklist. This is where you actually start thinking of individual projects and things that your office can do that is very that is sustainable and helps commit to that climate action plan and the university's sustainability mission. So to support you, we offer a lot of different tools for success. We have presentations, not just this one, but ones that you can provide to your colleagues in staff meetings. We have different guides. We have stickers and posters and signage. Um, you can see lots of examples of here to remind them to turn off light switches and to turn off their commun computer and print double-sided and those kinds of things. Um, and I already linked to the Green Office website, so we're not going to talk about that again. But then once you're certified, we uh, provide you with a certificate and a logo for your website and email signature so you can share the hard work that you've done getting certified and be very, very proud of it. Um, we provide recognition on the website. As I mentioned already, we have lists of offices. So as soon as you are certified at a higher level, we will update it and move you up. And the uh, certificates that we provide are in recycled frames. We have a recycled motherboard frame that you see in the top photo, as well as a reclaimed wood frame below. So here is a little bit of, uh, we don't have to go over this graph super in detail, but the different ways that staff actions have changed based on certification level. This is where that recertification staff survey that I mentioned comes into play because your staff will communicate the actions that they think that they are participating in. And as you can see, they all pretty much trend upward. The more involved in the green office program, the higher levels of certification, the more likely the rest of your office staff is to be involved in the program and the bigger changes that we make. This is where those 50,000 people start to really make a difference. Um, a little more specifically, there is waste. Um, as you can see, again, it just generally trends upward where we start throwing away less things, using really usable things. Um, energy, again, just trending upward. Um, you can see the different actions that we suggest as far as uh, turning your monitor off and turning lights off and how those behaviors really do just continue to amp up as you are further in, into the certification process. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Thunby now. Great, thank you. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges that people often face um, when, do you wanna turn off your sound? Sorry, we're in the same room and there's echoes happening. Um, so really the program was designed around um, thinking about the social science and psychology of how do we change our actions, how do we change our habits, and um, how can we do that effectively? And that's definitely one of the challenges of implementing the checklist. Um, we've really broken down each of the actions on the checklist and included information on how to complete the action, provided tools to help implement it, explain why it's important, um, so you can share that with your colleagues. But one of the biggest factors is just creating that culture change and getting that buy-in from people across your office. So generally, whenever we're trying to create any sort of social change, there's gonna be uh, just a small number of innovators. And in this case, we're thinking our green office representatives or our go reps are those people who are initiating the change. And um, we really encourage you all to focus your energy and attention towards people who are supportive and who are excited and enthusiastic. So you have multiple messengers encouraging sustainability to the rest of your office. So it's not just you talking about it, but you're, you're finding those people who are on board and collaborating with them. And don't focus all your time and attention on the people who tend to be may be very vocal about saying, you know, this doesn't matter, or, you know, we don't have time for this. If we can remove the attention from those naysayers and focus it towards the early adopters, that's gonna help create that shift where more and more people will catch on once they see it's becoming a new social norm. So a lot of research indicates that a lot of our decisions are not really based off of how much money we can save or how much we're helping the environment, a lot of our, our actions and habits are subconsciously, sub, subconsciously influenced by the people around us and what is perceived as a social norm. That's really what we're trying to emphasize by having everyone put up signage and reminders and, and, and post certificates and post a pledge that has signatures on it. 
um, and you know, share things on your website and um, on your email footer so that we're really establishing this as a social norm and people are kind of bringing visibility to things that might be um, habits they don't have mindfulness um, contributing towards. So in engaging your colleagues, um, I think when we're trying to drive a behavior change, so we're trying to remind people to, you know, if they're leaving the lights on every night, that adds up. If they're never recycling, that adds up. And, and we want to say something about it. But it's important that we um, engage people in a way that's respectful, that we don't create division by maybe bringing up feelings of shame or guilt in people and telling them what to do, rather kind of having a dialogue around why it's important and um, being encouraging and really focusing on the people who are making positive changes and shining the spotlight on them rather than kind of the negative reinforcement of the people who are, are not willing to make those changes. Um, so <laughs> you saw the checklist, you saw there's a lot on the checklist, there's a lot of different actions to choose from. So we do encourage folks to break it down to maybe like one topic area per month. And that's what we do in our newsletter. So we feature kind of one area of action per month, be that energy, transportation, water, waste, food, um, kind of breaking it down to explore why it's important that you do it. And not just giving people a laundry list of things to do, but kind of having some dialogue around how can we be more sustainable, not only in our daily habits, but in the decisions that we make and the impact that we have more broadly. Okay, so I'll quickly go through some tips and reminders so that we have time for some questions. Feel free to throw questions in the chat or chime in at the end. Um, so something new that we are launching this year in partnership with the Arboretum and Botanical Garden, which our campus is actually an Arboretum and Botanical Garden. Any office um, as part of our program can adopt a garden which means you can collaborate with them to select a garden site that you can volunteer at on a monthly basis. And they do ask for a five hour minimum per month. So if it's just you volunteering, that'd be you volunteering for five hours. But if there's five of you, each of you all would be volunteering for one hour. So cumulatively um, five hours. And that does count towards um, your checklist. There are options on the checklist to create your own actions. And this would apply into that section at any level of certification. Um, the rules for recycling on campus are actually different from the city of College Park or Prince George's County. So we do like to remind people to check out how to recycle on campus specifically. And we are collecting glass separately from the rest of our recycling now. Um, there are actually several programs on campus that help people to buy and donate UMD inventory items. So like things that are purchased by the university and owned by the university, you can donate through something called Terrapin Trader. Um, these are hyperlinked in the presentation. So when you send it out, you have access to all this information. Um, dining services, whenever you buy a coffee or a soda on campus, if you bring a reusable cup, you do get a discount from any campus cafe and shops. So there are you know, those things that are hard to remember, but hopefully the incentives help. Um, and there is specialty recycling. We do have more information on the recycling website that kind of describes all those hazardous materials or things that don't go in the mixed recycling bin, how to safely dispose of them. And we do collect compost across campus. Um, you can request a compost bin for an event and a recycling bin for an event if your office is hosting something. And through UMD catering, you can also request compostable packaging. So there's even compostable forks and knives and plates and cups that, that you can opt for if you're not going the reusable route, which is obviously even more sustainable. And Dining Services on Campus has a number of sustainability initiatives, one being the Campus Pantry, which offers food to people in need. Um, the food grown at the community garden on campus and the turf farm is donated to the Campus Pantry. So even people who are facing food insecurity have access to healthy food. And we do have a farmer's market every Wednesday on campus. Um, energy conservation, I feel like these are, this is one of the areas where people can kind of discredit the, the level of impact that we have. But when we do have these daily actions, they add up over time 
and cumulatively across campus, they do add up. So while I think somebody in my breakout session was talking about, you know, a lot of times industries and corporations are responsible for a great deal of pollution, for instance, fossil fuel companies. However, if we're consuming a whole lot of energy, extra energy and wasting energy, we're providing more business to those companies that are creating those emissions. So it is something that, that our actions and habits do tie in. And we definitely encourage people if they see any sort of leaks, um, whether it's a draft or a dripping faucet, those are another thing that, you know, even though there's a lot of common spaces on campus that no one individual is in charge of, we can still take the initiative to turn off the lights in common spaces and to take responsibility for um, reporting any issues we find. And um, if you remember from that graph, transportation is a big piece of our emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions. And luckily at UMD, there are an array of really great sustainable transportation programs. And you can figure out how to navigate them pretty easily using the Smart Commute platform. So there's a trip planning tool and you can find people to carpool with. You can compare the time it takes to take the shuttle versus walking versus biking versus driving. Um, and you can compare emissions, you can compare cost. So it's really, really helpful. It also shows bike routes, all kinds of great information. All right, so we made it to the end. And now I would love to hear any questions, any suggestions, any comments, or, or anything we could further clarify for you all. Oh, cool. I love this example that Jen shared saying that she offers an incentive in her office. So when people sign the pledge, they do get a reusable item so that they can have a tool in hand to help reduce their use of single use disposable plastics straws, which is really cool. Um, if people don't have questions and they want to share other suggestions that they kind of um, want to share or advice you'd like to share with other green reps on campus, feel free to use this time for that as well. I have never heard of a bad energy potato, but I'm, I'm very curious about what that means. <laughs> um, I think that um, prizes and incentives can be a double-edged sword. So if people are doing these sustainable actions, not through their motivation to want to be sustainable, um, and rather for a specific prize. There has been some research that shows that when that prize period ends or the competition period ends, those sustainable habits might end as well. Um, but creating incentives that are not just like more stuff and feeding into consumerism and materialism, but something that is a reusable item that can then displace the reliance on disposable items, I think is a really great way to bridge that gap between you know, trying to bribe people with more stuff to, to be sustainable and um, creating those kind of fun rewards and fun ways of recognizing people for the positive things that they do. And I think it sounds like this negative reinforcement thing is actually something that, that is humorous and lighthearted and not about shaming people, but really about having fun with it and um, keeping the topic alive. So I think it, it could work well because it, it does bring in humor and playfulness and not really like, you know, driving that, that sense that people can get defensive if they feel like they're being judged or called out in a more kind of serious way. Great, well, thank you all so much um, for attending today. Um, we hope that within one year from doing this training, you're able to get through one of the checklists and submit for certification. We will be following up with an email where we'll share these slides as requested um, and any, any links to our website um, that could be helpful for you as you get started, whether it's you're ready to register, you're ready to 
you know, complete a certification checklist, or if you just want to be in touch with us with any questions, and we're always happy, happy to help kind of be as involved as you need us to be to help you achieve certification. And you can always be in touch with us with any questions at greenoffice at umd.edu. Great. Thank you, guys. Hope you have Thank a great you. Day. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I have a quick question. I was wondering if I could stay on to ask. I would ask sure. the big group, but it's more like, you know, focus on me than everyone else. <laughs> um, so I work in.